I know what it is. <coughs> oh no, 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 that doesn't work at all. No, that doesn't work at all. It's gonna ruin my slides. Stream, what are we doing? Output video. No. Sorry guys, I'm gonna have to just, just cancel that. Cancel that. Turn the stream off. What are we looking? Alright. Do we have the snowball? Yes, we do. Right, so today we're looking at an area of law which we're only going to spend one week on. And it's kind of important because it's the area of law that we use for compensating people, where others, in the broad sense, do bad things to them. And I mean that in a really broad, general, nondescript sort of a way. Even though the law, by and large, makes sure that people only get compensation for quite specific, narrow, and targeted types of wrongs that happen to others. Um, and so we call this, this broad area or category uh, tort. Um, and tort, which comes from the French word for wrong, um, is just about finding ways to, of compensating people, putting people back to where they were as best as money can when bad things are done by others to them. Okay, so that's a broad, 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 broad sweeping statement about this area. But I think it's important to make the distinction at this stage between tort and contract. Because contracts are things that two parties enter into willingly. A whole bunch of rules, elements that need to be satisfied, to have two meetings of mind, to come together, to actually create obligations to each other. Was taught is not about that at all. It's about situations that come up where one person or one entity in some way harms another and we recognize that form of harm or that relationship between how that harm is caused as requiring these guys to compensate these guys here, to put them back as far as they can, uh, as far as money can, back to where they were. That's what this thing's all about. And so for this lecture, um, kind of fits into three areas, and I'm going to spend quite a bit of time at the start, deliberately, really talking about the definitions and talking about some of the base concepts of this. Um, taught, in particular, the, the area of taught called negligence, which is really the, the main focus of what we have for, for this subject for you guys, is, um, is actually pretty tricky. The law in it's pretty tricky. It's long-winded. It's, it's, it's complex, it's a lot of words used to describe things. And uh, again, as a person who came from an accounting background, I found that when I examined my knowledge, my existing knowledge that I'd picked up from the accounting subjects that we needed to do, it's equivalent of, of, of this for the undergrad, uh, for me at the University of Auckland, that this was an area, when I actually learnt it to become a lawyer, was not well taught. taught unfortunate two words with the different spellings but sound the same it wasn't well explained to us and I in hindsight didn't really know how this worked I went to class I paid attention it was a case about a snail and a ginger bottle famous case we'll get to it a bit later on but I didn't really know how it worked and so I think the takeaway I want to have for you guys here is actually not the depth not the mechanical depth of actually going through and analyzing things and using the rules in terms of the door. What I really want you guys to do here is to just get a high level understanding of how this sits in in relation to our legal system, how it sits in in relation to the civil and criminal d divide, and under civil law, how this is different and distinct from contract in particular. I think that that's a really handy thing. And I, I kind of have put a lot of things into here. Uh, in fact, I was talking to Steve Graw, the textbook order today. Um, he wrote this chapter about the things that I'd moved into, into his course. Uh, and partially, that's because I felt it wasn't well explained to me when I was doing accounting. And I'm trying to, to really pair that, to sort of undo it, unwind that, and give that back to you guys in something that's a little bit more digestible 
bit easier to follow um, and starting from essentially from first principles why we have this stuff and so the the three sort of areas that we're going to talk about over this the seminar um, divides into thoughts which is the broad term um, they really divide into two categories the things we call the specific torts which usually are very narrow causes of action so when very particular things have happened to a person then they get some sort of right for compensation all right so we're going to talk about each of those and there's many 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 of them and then the second third probably even more is going to be on the 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 tort of negligence itself because that's the, you know that is the big area and it's the one that comes up the most in the court system the one you guys will be the most exposed to in terms of your professional lives um, and then i'm going to spend a fair amount of time talking about damages because the <laughs> the calculation for damages in contract law relative to tort are, um, are a little easier even though we spent a fair amount of time talking about that last week about contract damages the damages for tort the, the rules work differently even though they're really still about compensating people that, that this fundamental rule which is different between tort and contract in contract with the principle of robinson and Harmon, the idea of damages is to put you where you would have been here tort the purpose of damages is to put you back as far as money can back to where you were um and you know let's appreciate with somebody that you know, breaks your arm or you know chops a finger off sometimes that can't that you can't get put back you lose an eye well, we can't give it back to you and so money in many situations is a poor substitute but our system is set up to do that as best it can um, okay any questions on the on that so far or should we kick into it all right so again this comes from my own heartfelt uh, pleadings almost like the old version of me me in my 20s me in my 20s could go and ask the me in my 40s what things would have been nice to have known when doing this under an accounting major i would have liked somebody to just explain what these particular technical words are um have you guys seen the uh i don't know if you heard about this the jcu a guy called peter ridd a professor at jcu it's been in the news one of the jcu academics who made scathing comments about the quality of environmental and reef science and basically argued with the university and so they fired him and he went to court and the judgment came back yesterday um, and he won he won quite spectacularly and a statement got released by sandra harding who's the vice chancellor here it clearly wasn't written by her in fact it clearly was not written by somebody with a legal background it was you know it's cringy to read um talking about particular legal things that they the person who wrote it thought was which wasn't sandra we thought was wrong with that particular uh judgment and we're just reading it and just going this is rubbish it's just it just makes no sense and, um, and the reason for that is that there are some basic things you need to know about how law and legal actions and things are structured and here um i, I think i'm just going to start by a phrase i've probably used a few times called a cause of action because this is something that comes up by the way i found it in terms of marking these and things like exams particularly for the first years you guys are generally a little bit better it's not uncommon for me to be marking exam and a student to say oh well the plaintiff the person bringing this cause of action and negligence for example there's three elements they've proved the first two but didn't succeed on the third one therefore instead of getting a hundred thousand dollars they'll only get sixty six thousand dollars all right no no fundamentally when we hear the phrase a cause of action that is a series of points that need to be proven and again, uh, to a particular level in, in the criminal law it's beyond reasonable doubt in civil law which is taught in contract on balance of probabilities those things need to be proven in order to succeed so in the criminal sense for example if got into a fight pick up a machete and chop someone's arm off the crown needs to prove that you unlawfully caused grievous bodily harm those are the three elements of that particular offense under section 320 i think of the queensland criminal code 
Crown needs to prove all three, three of those things beyond reasonable doubt. If they do, you are found guilty of grievous bodily harm. And you will receive the appropriate punishment for that. Here, when we're talking about torts, each of them does also has this series of elements that need to be proved. All of them need to be proved on balance of probabilities. So more likely that the thing happened than it didn't happen. I mean, some judges say that it's, it's perhaps not correct to say 51% likely um, because you don't want to make this test sound a little a bit too scientific. It's deliberately not supposed to be scientific. Otherwise, you would literally have statisticians rocking up to court with a bell curve and say, oh, well, Your Honour, you know, it's 51%. Um, so they, they've intentionally left that language a little bit vague. More likely than not that the thing happened. Okay, and we've actually had some examples of this. So, for example, um, misrepresentation. A series of elements that need to be proved. Um, uh, oh, breach of contract. Um, if you were trying to prove the existence of a contract, you'd need to prove a ser series of elements. Remember what they are? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Capacity, offer, mutuality, intention to create legal relations, legality, um, acceptance, and uh, the other one. <laughs> yeah, mutuality. Is that one I missed? Yeah, yeah, good, good job. Good job. Um, again, pretty rare that you, you need to, to do those things in a court, but in theory, when going in, you'd have to prove those things. Um, there are other sorts of cause of actions. Again, all of the torts have a series of elements. I, I don't teach it for this subject, but something that's becoming increasingly more a part of our legal system is what's called a breach of a statutory duty. Um, for example, it is uh, unlawfully to publicly um, racially vilify people in public. All right? This doesn't come from the common law. Parliament or actually the government, I should say, enter into, into a treaty. And part of that treaty, which is the um, Racial Discrimination Act, was to put in federal law a duty. Right? People living in this country, and I, I say citizens in the broad sense, not the technical uh, Australian sense, so people inside Australia's jurisdiction must not publicly vilify somebody on the basis of their race or ethnicity. Right? There is a duty. It is a statutory duty, and there are certain consequences that flow from that in terms of rights that people have. Now, for this subject, we're not, I'm not too interested about these particular um, duties that have come in. There's actually just a new one coming in Queensland, the New Human Rights Act. I'll bring one in as well. But um, what I'll say here is that the area of tort that we learn about in this actually comes from judge-made law. The common law rules, so these, all of these series of elements that we have for each of these torts I'm going to talk about, they come from the heads of judges, and it's old. This area of law has developed over a long time. Some areas of tort are very, very old. Others are actually relatively recent. Um, one of the things that I, again, I didn't really understand how this all worked when I was doing accounting, when we were talking about the tort of negligence, I thought that this thing only started in the 20th century with the snail and the ginger model case. It's actually incorrect. Um, but it's still relatively recent, the last couple of hundred years. All right. And so this idea of elements is a really important thing to note. There are things that you have to prove to the, to the court in order to succeed. If you do succeed in all the elements, you win. You're going to get some form of remedy. Uh, and the level of proof, again, as I mentioned, the civil matters, it's on balanced probabilities. Criminal matters, uh, beyond reasonable doubt. Okay, now, this is where things start to get a little bit tricky when we're talking about fault. Um, and this idea of having fault or fault elements. Okay, because we use these words in common parlance, in an ordinary language, we use the term fault, we use the term cause, and we use the term accident. In relation to these terms, you have to leave them aside. You actually have to suspend disbelief for a little bit, because each of these words has particular technical legal meanings. And so when we're thinking about a word like fault, and we think about the natural association we have with that, um, sometimes what we naturally think is the person crashed their car into me. They're at fault. It 
It's a very natural thing. I'm standing still. They crashed into me. But there are other ways that you can be at fault in relation to things. For some of these torts, uh, intention. You actually have to intend something in order to be at fault. For others, the bar can be a little bit lower. Um, again, the tort of negligence or negligence as an element can be part of that, having a duty fallen below a certain standard. And in some situations, and this is this idea of strict liability, they don't have fault elements. All right, in some forms of causes of action, it doesn't matter about fault. And interestingly, we've actually come across an area of law where fault isn't an element, and that's contract. The fact that it wasn't your fault that you couldn't deliver the goods to the other side is irrelevant. Breach of contract doesn't have a fault element. Did this particular event happen? Yes. Tick. You win. Well, they win because you're the, you're the one breaching. So that's a, a really important thing to note. In torts, most torts, there is a fault element. If you hear the phrase strict liability, that means that you are assigned responsibility to that. It doesn't matter about any particular aspect of fault. Um, and that's the sort of thing that happens for things um, like this university. All right? This university, for example, can be held liable for things that happen in it, even though nobody in the university has been there, nobody was around. You slip and fall over, for example. Uh, it's not a very good example because I guess fault is allocated somewhere. That's a, no, a better example might be you're driving a truck filled with explosives. This is actually one of the rare corner cases where you can actually be found criminally responsible for stuff without being at fault. All right? um, if that truckload with explosives in it explodes, or whatever have you, you're held liable, even though the cause of the accident may have nothing to do with you at all. Why? Because the law says you have a duty, a very, very high duty, while having and doing things with explosives. And if something bad happens, you're going to be responsible. Doesn't matter. We categorize you as being into, into this category of persons who's going to have to pay as a result. And that's what we, that's essentially what we call strict liability. Those that have to pay, even though there's no actual intention component to that. All right, um, another form of liability is called vicarious liability. That is when one person renders another one liable. And the classic situation is when somebody is acting as your employee. If we think about this, who is an employee has broken something while on their employer's time? Come on, be honest. Some of you guys must have broken something at some stage. Um, who has to pay for it? Well, I don't know, in other countries, you, people might you know, argue that it probably is the employee's fault, but generally in Australia, in terms of employees doing things while taking bona fide or genuine steps in the course of their employment, if something breaks, the employer is going to be held liable. All right, and we call that vicarious liability, people being essentially standing in the shoes of others. Um, uh, we'll talk about agency in a couple of weeks' time as well. Um, that's where other people act directly on your behalf. But um, actually, yeah, Justice, have you had that? Have you had employees that have broken things in the in the past? Any of your staff ever yep. broken stuff? Yeah, who had to pay for it? Yeah. Are you? Yeah, you were not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not supposed to. We're not. We're not supposed to um, make them pay for it. In fact, I remember working for places where my boss would actually go and say, uh, I worked in petrol stations, washing windows. I was going through university. Doesn't even exist in Australia these days. Um, and they, um, yeah, my boss, he would tell people, oh, I'm going to take that out of your paycheck. You absolutely can't do that in, in, in Australia. Ooh, get in trouble. But um, the idea is that when things happen and a person in the scope of their employment and things break, the um, employer ends up being liable. And if your employee again, in the scope of their employment, hurts someone else. If I'm at the, uh, so here's an example. I, wasn't, I was working at a petrol station. I didn't really know much about cars when I was little. 
And so I remember some guy came with some fancy lease car and I went to, I was rushing around the little forecourt and he wanted me to top up the water. So I just opened up the bonnet, found something, opened it, poured water in. And uh, yeah, my boss, like a week later, after he got the bill or whatever from that company, he's like, don't you know the difference between a water inlet and a power steering inlet? Sorry. Um, but yeah, I was at fault, but my employer is rendered liable. And that's vicarious liability. All right. Okay. More definitions. In tort, when we use the word intention, now intention is a horrible word at law. Why? It's really hard to prove. It's very, very hard to prove. I mean, how do you actually step inside someone's head, find out whether they actually intended to punch that person, to steal that car, it's not a good example, but um, or you know, to, to kill this person, to hurt this person over here, or to um, to walk onto their neighbor's land. How do you prove those things? Can you chop the head open and have a look? Can't. So intention and law, because it's so difficult, and look, it's been a difficult problem, problem that's faced legislative drafters for a long time. They've in some places they try to remove it. So Queensland, for example, the Queensland Civil uh, uh, criminal code which is uh, very similar to the code used in Nigeria in PNG and in Western Australia um, they call it the Griffith code so Samuel Griffith took almost all instances of the word intention out because it's too hard it's just too hard to prove um, and so there's not a lot of point rendering or trying to bring people to court for crimes where that you need to prove they intended to do that so they said we're just not going to we're not going to worry about that we're still going to have these things in there and look intent is still part of the criminal law um and what you have to do though is you look at all of the circumstances you know did this guy intend to burn that house down well he went and bought 50 liters and two jerry cans walked around the whole house poured all of the things out had bought a whole bunch of matches um and the the jury in that situation is given all of these pieces of information and they're the ones that have to determine did the person have the requisite intent in tort law though um, there are some torts that do actually have um, intent as an element they're pretty rare that they come up in the court house to be honest pretty pretty rare um, but just make note that when we're talking about the in these intentional torts actually intending to do something or putting your head in the sand and just being absolutely flagrantly disregarding of other people in relation to doing stuff, what we call recklessness, is the same thing in tort. So again, it's that idea that if, if you're doing something, um, if you get a gun and you shoot someone, right? and again, I'm thinking in terms of the tort, the actual harm, the civil action, clearly there's a criminal matter here as well. Although, um, you know, I'm trying to think in gun clubs, or, uh, leaving, the, leaving the criminal side, side out of it. It's one thing to go up, pick somebody and shoot them, right? But it's quite a different thing, you would think, if you are in a crowded market, you have a gun, you close your eyes and you shoot it, all right? And we do make that distinction in some aspects of the criminal law, but we don't make it in tort. Closing your eyes into a market and shooting somebody or actually aiming and shooting them is essentially the same thing. Um, it's just this flagrant disregard or wanton recklessness is the same as intent. So there's that willfully closing your eyes and just not caring um, about stuff. It's going to be the same thing. Okay. Um, there is some of these torts as well have this idea of uh, directness. When we, we later on talk about the tort of negligence, it doesn't have this need for directness. In fact, it is the sort of famous, most important, indirect tort. All right. Most of the other ones are older. They're older things. The tort of battery. If you directly strike or touch somebody, all right, you had to prove that you directly caused something to happen. Or does you, usually in that situation with battery, uh, infringing on the person. Um, now, this definition of directness actually includes things where there's a, a, an unbroken chain. And so the example that we use, the famous example is, is Scott and Shepherd, uh, where one person had what they call a squib. A squib 
is the sort of thing I don't know well, what sort of generations everyone's here, but the old Disney cartoons, Wile E. Coyote would have these little metal balls with a fuse on the end. This is sound ring of all these old little cartoons when growing up and the fuse would run out. It's like an old bomb. You just imagine essentially a metal sphere that you could hold with gunpowder in the middle and a fuse. All right? So we imagine this. So just imagine that I have this metal thing and I threw that to Gary. He went, what? Throw it to justice. Throw it, throw it, throw it, throw it, throw it. And then it explodes down this end. What the courts have said is that that unbroken chain, that's a direct action. Even though I threw it this way and the harm happened over there, that's fine. That's fine. We're going to be sufficiently direct in terms of um, causing that particular event to happen at the end. So when we use this idea of direct, um, usually, again, I'll talk about for interference of the person. If there is this unbroken chain, that's fine. It's still going to count as direct interference over here. Right. Um, but negligence doesn't need that. Tort of negligence doesn't need that. And that's why it's a relatively recent phenomenon. Because in the ye old days, 500 years ago, you could only seek compensation from people if they'd somehow directly hurt you. Um, which is, you know, this idea of negligence and having this indirect stuff is relatively recent. Um, Hutchins and Maud involved uh, somebody walking in to uh, land and placing poison. And there they talked about directness in that this unbroken chain, placing the poison on the ground, and then the neighbor's dogs came along and ate them. That's going to be fine. Even though you think about it, you place it and you've walked away, there's a gap in time. That's fine sufficiently direct okay uh, um, you guys may have noticed this when we we're doing contract law that we did have what the, some of those vitiating factors where you took into account people's um, you know mental infirmity all right but I may have said this to you by and large being um, insane for want of a better word doesn't actually excuse you from breach of contract. You can't get off or out of a contract by just saying, I'm not, I don't have sufficient capacity to do that. When we talk about capacity as an element of contract, mental infirmity doesn't actually come into that. And it's a similar thing with tort as well. Um, in uh, Carrier and, and Bonham, uh, a guy stepped who was found to be mentally unwell. In fact, I think he escaped from a mental hospital and he stepped in front of a bus and the bus driver hit him. And the issue was for the trauma caused to the bus driver as a result, whether or not the guy being insane would essentially get off, get him off from any responsibility and negligence. The judge said, no, no, it won't. When trying to determine intent for these torts that have intent, yeah, sure, actually knowing and understanding what and how something works does have a mental component to it sure we can take the fact that a person may not understand what they're doing into account but not for negligence not for situations where one person owes a duty of care to another and the third party somehow gets it needs compensated as a result and so it's just you know it's important to note with these things that you can become liable for stuff or you can sue people who otherwise you might not have thought would actually be able to compensate you in terms of uh, the situations. And um, children, uh, the courts there have said that children can by default be liable. Again, usually children render their parents vicariously liable. If your child goes into a store and breaks something or eats something, is there a contract? No. Can you be held vicariously liable? Yes. So you don't, and although I have to say this, when I, the look in my oh, eight-year-old, this is actually a few years ago, I think it was seven, seven-year-old's eye, when I told him that up until the age of 10, he can't be held criminally responsible for anything at all, you can see this gleam in his eye when he found out, but he could still make me tortiously liable for doing naughty things. Um, and so that's why I'll try, I, I still will try and keep them on the straight and narrow, not sending my child up, up through chimneys to 
the things off or whatever have you. Um, but just make note when we're talking about um, when we talk about negligence, we talk about the elements of negligence and the appropriate standard. Um, that standard is actually for a, a child of that particular age. So when we're thinking about how these things are structured, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, it's that sector, and also their um, intent. When you're trying to determine whether a child intended to do something, again, it's harder to prove. You can take their age into account um, when, when doing those things. So that's why trying to sue kids is a little bit tricky as a result. Okay. Still going on definitions. I've got a broad definition of tort itself, um, a specific type of civil action arising from a wrong where some form of rights have been infringed. These are all common law causes of actions, judge-made law. You won't find it in a statute. Some of it is regulated by Parliament, so that we have this thing called the Civil Liabilities Act, which caps the amount of damages and gives judges a little bit of guidance in terms of how these things are. But by and large, these things are found in, um, in the common law, although there's one exception. Is it on there? Uh, yes, it is. There's one exception, which is defamation. Um, I'll talk about that. All right. So I'm just going to go through each of these. And make note that we're doing this as part of a business degree. All right. So that it's, I'm, per, uh, I'm very, very conscious of the fact that some of these thoughts are very narrow. They're not things that are likely to come up very often. And I think it, it's useful to learn them in the context of the important ones, which I think for doing this subject is negligence and defamation. And defamation's on, on the rise in terms of, uh, in terms of this stuff. Um, so okay, we'll come back to that. So they've got some examples of torts here and I'm just gonna start just literally rolling through them. But make note that look, I'm not gonna assess, and so your, um, your uh, project task, which is out um, on Learn Jesse now, won't involve these torts or doesn't involve these torts. And I, in terms of the examination for the subject, I don't think any of these will come in that either. Possibly we'll have some defamation stuff in there, but there won't be specific torts. So it's really for your knowledge in terms of how, um, how this law sits together. And you guys are aware from this point onwards in the subject, there's, this week, well, maybe last week actually, uh, this, no, sorry, I take that back. Last week, there, um, there's no, uh, none of this stuff is in your test. Test for next the week, online the online test. Yeah. But it, uh, you you won't get these things. You won't do. I won't have these again. Look, no, you you just won't. You, this, I won't put specific towards other than possibly defamation. And often these things are just in terms of explaining stuff. Um, the the key thing about knowing this is seeing how they fit together. They're small things, they don't come up much. Um, but just note, this is the mechanism you can become liable. And there's a couple of, of gotchas in terms of these specific torts, which makes them different from negligence, and it involves this stuff, which I think is a useful thing for you guys to know. Um, okay, so uh, the first tort we learn when we're doing well, I'm doing law, actually, is, uh, is battery. And so that is where somebody, again, has the element of directly and intentionally touching another. Um, and again, there's an excuse to this, which is either consent or lawful justification. So lawful justification, police officers can touch you when they're arresting you. All right. When you are playing football, you are implicitly consenting to being touched. All right. That just forms part of the activity that you're doing. Um, so, that's those, so those two things will negate this particular tort. But by default, if somebody intentionally and directly interferes with the person um, that you can sue them. Your rights have been infringed. The human body is considered, I guess, in law to be sacred. Our, our space. It's our space. So, something came up in the news a couple of weeks ago. I lost some friends over. Oh, Ross, they're a bit grumpy with me. The egg boy. I talked about this last week. with The, the senator. You guys, there's a senator who literally got 16 votes. 16 primary votes. This guy got to be a senator and he collects 250 grand a year and he got 17 votes. And that's why Australia's preference system is a tad quirky. We'll, we'll go with quirky. Um, anyway, so this guy who's 
intensely dislikable, right? 99, 95, 99% of the population intensely dislikes this man. Um, uh, he's essentially a Nazi. And so this kid came up and whacked him with an egg. All right. And the issue there, and this is the real problem, this is the real problem, the fact that I intensely dislike this person, from my perspective anyway, actually doesn't justify violence. There's no justification. The key thing is that the guy's so unlikable, he, he wouldn't have consented to this action. Whereas, I don't know if you guys, did I tell the story last week? There was a New Zealand politician about two years ago, Stephen Joyce, who was a minister. And some lady was talking at Waitangi, which is the place up north where they had the treaty signed and stuff. And some lady actually came along, <laughs> this is quite funny, Kiwi politics, and threw a, a sex toy at him. And so there's this slow motion video of Stephen Joyce being hit in the face with a dildo like this. And he had a laugh. The journalists had a laugh. The people had a laugh. The ladies had a laugh. The cops are having a laugh. You know? And the context of that meant that you probably could get by with consent as part of an excuse to this, strictly speaking, being a battery. Um, so just make note that consent matters. And because Fraser Anning is such a not nice person, he's the sort of person that wouldn't consent to things like that. And so the trouble was somebody like me as a solicitor, the guy didn't consent to it. Um, and so that's, strictly speaking, that's what the law is. The fact that I don't like that doesn't change what the law is. And me personally, I think that violence shouldn't form part of political discourse, civil political discourse in, uh, in, the, good, in the decent society. But anyway, I lost some friends over that one. I don't talk to me anymore. Okay. Um, yeah, so just make note, uh, a couple of things there. What have we got? Rickson and Star City. Um, Rickson and Star City was a, uh, a case involving a person who was at a casino. And the issue was when being grabbed by the security guards on the shoulder, come with me. Is that um, battery? And the answer is yes. Yes, it's going to be. Grabbing somebody and doing them just on the face of it is actually not, they're not, you know, most times going to consent to that. No, they don't have the same protection. Now, there's a couple of things that come from that. Is that if you, and again, we'll talk about this, it comes up in the uh, uh, Myers and Sue, um, you'll find, first of all, there's a real politic thing going here. The police will never charge somebody in terms of doing that. All right. But I actually have some examples from community legal that I've had with doing this. Strictly speaking, it is going to be a battery. You can get a common law, this idea of lawful uh, um, justification, right, if the person's in the process of committing a crime, right? A crime, though, not a tort. So if somebody's breaching a contract or if somebody is, um, and again, I'm trying to think of an example of a casino. That's perhaps not a very good example. Um, if somebody's taking stuff that they think actually belongs to them, they have an honest and reasonably held belief that the particular thing is theirs, if you go and grab them and tackle them, all right, and it turns out that it actually, they actually genuinely held that belief, even if sometimes they're wrong about doing it, that can actually render you um, under this tort actually liable. So that makes sense. If somebody comes in, comes into a store to pick up something that, they've, that they think they've already paid for, all right? And again, you've got burdens of proof here you know, in terms of how things have to be proved. So if somebody comes into your store, picks up something, walks out with it, and you spear tackle them, what are you doing? And it's actually not whether or not the things are paid for, it's whether or not the person actually had an honest claim of right to it um, in terms of that. So you've got some onus things coming here as well in terms of who has to prove stuff. But just be a little bit mindful, particularly those, anybody here had to run or had to work in retail? Anybody worked in retail had to sell things to the public? Um, well, I worked in retail when I was young and a couple of times being a stroppy football playing young lad a couple of times there were some naughty peeps came in and I remember washing windows and the guy inside's buzzing me buzz 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 the guy, uh, guy who I work with who's actually the godfather of my child I've known for a very long time and uh the next thing I know my friend Moppy who's only a midget he's so small running after some kid who was stolen something I can't remember what it was and so I raced after him 
and then ran down the street and tackled the guy and rolled onto the road and we've got this five lane motorway and we're wrestling and people are tooting at us and uh in the context of doing that in fact i worked at harvey norman as well some guy stole a copy and this is a laugh of windows 2000 this gives you a good indication of when that was and after i went again chased them down and tripped them and tackled them and as i'm hauling them back a couple of things happened first of all i said oh bro it's a real good operating system though you should probably pay for it and the uh the other one was when we had a massive big store manager huge big uh, Maori guy and he w had his arm around this guy while he's escorting them and i'm just like richie oh yeah you know, step off don't want to be touching them while they're in there um, the idea is that if he runs away we'll just tackle him again but this physical act of touching you have to be a little bit mindful the body is still sacred in our system Okay, uh, Fagan and Metro, Metropolitan Commissioner of Police. Some of these are a little bit funny. So when I see them, I start laughing early because I remember the facts. But I'll tell you now. So this guy got stopped at a bre uh, breath test. This is a long time ago, 60s. So mm, breathalyzer is not so fabulous there. It's an English case. And anyway, the, um, the cop said to this guy who was in the car, the defendant, Mr. Fagan, is the... Um, uh, Oh, no, it might have been, Fagan might have been the police officer. So anyway, this guy's there, and he is in the car, being stopped by the cop, and the cop says, drive over there. All right, and so he drives over there, just a little bit, or come forward a little bit, so he comes forward a little bit. And then the cop said, oh, look, you've driven over my foot. Um, you, can you reverse, please? And the cop, and the guy says, no, you can just wait. And so the cop, his foot is stuck under the car, and the issue there is that um, it was that direct interference with the person? And it's like, well, the court said that, look, it probably wouldn't have been when the thing came on, when you, told, when you decided that you weren't going to do it, to, to move the thing off. In that situation, we are going to say that there's going to have this direct interference with it. They're all a little silly, some of these cases, aren't they? They're a little bit silly. Uh, Barton and Armstrong was a, a case, oh, the next one, which is the next tort. Very unfortunately, um, in the criminal law, we use the word assault in Queensland to mean touching, whacking, spraying, throwing things at, uh, somehow interfering with another person. We use the term assault in the criminal law, but we use the term battery in the civil law, in, tort, in the tort law. And, the, and oddly, I don't know why this is, we do still use the word assault in, in civil law, but it has a, a much narrower meaning, and that is to is to actually scare somebody into thinking they're about to be struck or hit or a battery is imminent. So that if you create this reasonable apprehension of fear that somebody's about to receive an imminent battery, it looks like you're about to punch someone, um, we call that assault. I don't know why. I haven't actually worked out why this distinction exists. But the creation or the apprehension of fear is, is, is the right that's being infringed here. Uh, people have a right to not walk around town thinking they're about to be whacked in the head. Um, and so as a person used to go to direct intentionally, unlawfully, causes reasonable apprehension of an imminent battering. Um, I'll, yeah, the, again, don't threaten to hit people. Because if you threaten to hit somebody, that is a tort in itself. It's got different elements, but fundamentally that's it's the same thing. A person who is scared as a result of this can actually seek some form of compensation in the courts okay false imprisonment uh, and again this comes up in things like retail where you find somebody stealing something and you grab them and you hold them there and in myers and sue the um myers is a store in australia it's a uh, chain chain of stores and so they they're the security guards they found some guy um who they reckon was stealing and they made him Say, boy, you have to wait here till the police gets here. You've got to wait. You've got to wait in this room till the police get here. Come with us, and you've got to wait till the police get here. And they never touched him. They just said, you have to wait here. And they never actually barred the door. Like, they didn't actually lock the door. Right, but the courts actually said it was still going to be false imprisonment because you gave the impression to the guy that he couldn't leave. All right? You've got to, as, as part of doing this, if you're somehow overbearing the will of a person to make them think that they cannot escape, or you physically restrain them, I mean, physically doing it's going to be fine, but that's 
sufficient but not not necessary um what's the other there is it's got to be direct either intentional or negligent you can actually negligently imprison people um somebody's come in to the office to get something and you lock all the doors because you didn't see them come in lock all the doors leave them in there and they're stuck there overnight um strictly speaking that's false imprisonment you didn't mean to do it but again assuming they can prove there was a duty of care you fell below an appropriate and reasonable standard as a result of that duty of care and harm came as a result got it and this idea of either restraining or preventing them from escaping giving them uh no reasonable means of egress so the case we had a few weeks ago the penny mr robertson and the belmain ferry whether he puts the penny in and puts the penny out he tried to argue by the way one of many things he tried to argue as well as the contract law stuff that the belmain ferry company had falsely imprisoned him because they wouldn't let him off the wharf unless he put the penny in to get back outside again remember that it was penny in and penny out hey and so he failed on that and the reason for that is the court said look strictly speaking you could get off you get wet but you could get off you could actually do that it wasn't completely stopping you from doing that it just created an inconvenience right? a mere inconvenience is not going to be sufficient a massive inconvenience probably would be so for example um, driving up to paluma stopping somebody by sealing off the main road and telling well, you know strictly speaking the person could walk that's a very large inconvenience there's only one road in you'd probably be fine to, to succeed in an action for that all right uh, these this last one it's a very unusual area of law um, they call it action on the case it's it's kind of a corner case where something has happened that was done intentionally but the results are indirect how would this come up again some narrow corner cases doing something like setting booby traps for somebody actually setting traps up now you're not directly interfering with them all right the courts have said this that look there's a delay in time here it's not the same as hutchins and morn we're directly putting the things on there and then the dogs eating them we do accept there is a delay in time but you intend to cause harm again intent's usually real hard to prove which is why this doesn't come up very often um, in fact, the, the, other, uh, the other area where this comes up is when you say something which is harmful to a particular person, all right, causes them to go off, and you're doing it intentionally, intending to harm them directly, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, as a result of, of the particular thing you're saying. So we call that the tort of Wilkinson and Downton. Um, it falls under this thing. And Wil Wilkinson and Downton was where the, uh, some guy went and told a woman that his her husband who worked in a mine had died and he did it as a practical joke yeah so he intended it to be a bit of a laugh right she got very distraught and wanted to seek compensation and she won she won why because while you weren't intending for that particular result to happen you were intending some aspect of harm to happen there as a role might have only been lighthearted you might have thought that it was only there but you actually did intend to do that to deceive her in order to cause some form of reaction and now the court said in that situation again she still has to prove the causation aspect which is the hard part um, and intention which is also really hard so this is why these things don't come up much but it can exist it can exist so just make note making statements to people that is actually going to be hurtful to them they still have to prove it the person who gets home has to be prove it you know, get your psych psychologist reports and such like but there is an area of law where a person can bring that action under that this is all civil law everything we talk about today is civil law so we've got criminal civil and under civil law we've got contract and then we have tort and then under tort we've got the subset of what we call the specific torts of which each of these four is one and then we have the uh the non-specific tort of which there is only one and it's negligence but it's large large to talk about so we'll come back come back to that yeah assault the word assault is used in two senses in the civil sphere the tort of assault is where you make somebody you intentionally make somebody think they're about to be whacked in the head it's the fear you're creating or instilling some imminent fear of 
of a fear of an imminent battery. You're about to get whacked. That is in the civil sphere, in the tort of assault. When the police charge a person with assault, that is in the criminal sphere. That definition comes from the Queensland Criminal Code. And unfortunately, in the criminal sphere, it includes both the, the intending to, to scare somebody and actually whacking them. Um, just unfortunate in terms of the way the words are used. All right. These ones don't come up much. Don't come up much. Uh, again, try not to falsely imprison people. If somebody's stealing from your store, all right, make sure you're sure. Because if you're not, they can see you. And I've done some research on this. In fact, an ex-JCU law student got a very large damage awards. Um, well known to the police. In fact, I've talked about him already. This is Pat Coleman. Um, Pat Coleman, who was the guy I think I talked about with the, um, handing out the pictures of the, of the corrupt coppers in Flinders Mall, he actually had another matter which went to the Queensland Supreme Court where he was campaigning for whatever outside Tharangawa, now Tharangawa Library, but the Queensland Parliament was up and they were sitting there for a week. And uh, he's sitting there complaining and then the cops come along, okay, Pat, you've had your fun. It's time to go. I picked him up and moved him. And he sued them for false imprisonment. He won. He won quite a lot of money too, like 50 grand. Um, these are non-trivial sums of money. False imprisonment, the courts take really seriously heavily. Like they, they take very, very seriously. It is not uncommon for people to get six-digit sums of money, um, particularly if the circumstances warrant ag aggravation. Um, so detaining somebody, and again, this is quite a ghastly example, but uh, two police officers who detained somebody and it held them out and then urinated on them. All right, so the circumstances matter. Right? But just by default, being picked up and put somewhere and not being released, the courts find our personal liberty. So our body is sacred, so is our personal liberty. It's a fundamental part of, of our, um, you know, the, the DNA of the Australian legal tradition. And so you get large dollar rewards. So if you grab somebody in your store because you think they're stealing, make sure you are right because it will be very expensive. If you're not, uh, well, it's lawful. It's lawful to go through and, and do that. It's, it's provided again, the police are there. Again, usually these things happen, and usually the police, as a result, will usually charge. It's tricky with young people. Young young people is where it's trickier because the police are very reluctant to charge young people. They go through the youth justice system, um, but young people, fortunately, don't know much about the law, so they're probably not going to see you anyway. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah, there you go. There you go. I, um, I've, I've told you the teddy bear story, haven't I? Teddy bear story? I, I haven't I told you? I'm sure I have. Oh, okay, I'll tell you the story. This is on public record, so I'm, I'm not feeling bad about this. So there was, uh, I was doing community legal, involved uh, a particular matter that involved uh, a guy <laughs> who... I can't give the specific reasons about what he was trying to seek as a result, but the thing flowed from him going to court where he was trying to sue the police. All right, again, to do with um, uh, yeah, false imprisonment, and so that sort of stuff. And it, it came out like this. Uh, basically, it was a stationery store. Uh, we call it a news agent. News agent, is that the word you Australians use? Uh, news agent. And they had a big teddy bear. Why not to a teddy bear store? The big meter tall teddy bear, like hundred dollar teddy bear, and uh, and so it got stolen from the store in Stockton. They checked the security cameras, got the police in, and the cop who was looking was like, ah, oh, I know this person, and so they um, they went to find this teddy bear at a house on Manning Island. The, that police officer and eleven members of the Northern Drug Squad. And they magically found the teddy bear and they magically found a whole bunch of drugs. Why would you do that? You need a warrant to go into somebody's house. So you can think that they have drugs, be damn sure that they've got drugs, but you can't walk into their house and say, here's the drugs, even though you know exactly where they are. And so magically they found these drugs under a bucket of dog food. You know, that's, that was a funny place to be looking for a meter tall teddy bear, but oh, you know, there we go. And so the issue there was that as part of doing this, and because again, the bit that's on public record is the um, the guy was, had an altercation with the police, and he supposedly hurt his arm. All right, and so partially, when doing this, he also was resi resisting arrest, and so he was charged with resisting arrest. And 
self-represented in the magistrate's court and got off the charge of resisting her arrest because the magistrate wasn't convinced at the moment the guy was pointing his finger at the police officer that he was actually obstructing them. Right, that. that doesn't mean all of a sudden that it's false imprisonment. That's the, really the key takeaway from that. That's a whole different kettle of fish. You need to prove these things, those elements of that situation. It doesn't render, just because you weren't obstructing the police, doesn't render them arresting you, given that he also pleaded guilty on a bunch of others, doesn't render the, um, the, the arrest unlawful. It's still lawful for the police to do that. Right. Now, these ones don't come up very much. There are some other specific torts that do come up a little bit more. Now, unfortunately, here's another word that we use in general, the general sense, lay sense, I suppose, that has a specific legal meaning. And that is the word trespass. Because to trespass is to directly interfere with something or someone. And the most common way we think of the word trespass is to do with land. But strictly speaking, trespasses actually can be to the person and to goods as well. All right. In law, we use it for all three. In fact, the previous slide, when I talked about the torts of assault and battery and false imprisonment, oh, well, not false imprisonment, but the first two, they are strictly speaking trespass to the person. It's direct interference with the person, with the body for those two. And so, now, here though, I'm specifically talking about trespass to land. And again, it's this direct interference. So if one person directly interferes with the land of another, again, without those two things at the end, consent or lawful justification, then the other person can be found liable in trespass. And one thing to note about this, actions in trespass, either to land or to goods or to the person, are what's we call, what, we, what we call in law actionable per se. What does that mean? It means that like breach of contract, when you go to the court, you're always going to win something. It might not be very much, it might be $10, but you're always going to get a reward or a result or some amount of damages. So strictly speaking, we're in this class now, and well, the egg, egg boy, the egg boy example. That Fraser Anning guy, in theory, if that was taken to court, would probably get $100. If we were on TV and we're talking about, I don't know, whatever we doing an interview about something that you're into and some guy comes up and cracks an egg on your face and it's humiliating you'd get tens of thousands of dollars for that why because the circumstances matter the aggravating circumstances of humiliation fraser anning isn't really very likable and he's a public figure so you're not going to get those damage awards for the humiliation aspect because if the guy didn't hit him and just stood behind him Mocking, the, mocking him, you can't get an award for that. You're a public figure. Whereas us as citizens, we can. We can. We can get money for that. Okay, so all of this direct interference with the person, or to land or to goods, you can get money. So if you trespass on someone's land, even though you don't cause harm, strictly speaking in our legal system, they can go to court and they will win. Assuming, again, they don't have some form of consent or justification. So... Just leave that in the back of your mind. Now, it doesn't really happen as much in Australia, but I'm a Kiwi, and so it's not at all uncommon when we're walking around, we're walking on someone's farm. When I grew up in sort of a, a rural area, and you were just, well, as kids, we would just get up and just walk and just cross over stuff. We were respectful, and when you're walking through paddocks, usually you walk along the edge, not through where the stock is, and you make sure you close gates and all that sort of stuff. But strictly speaking, it's trespass. I don't have the consent of the owner. Yeah, no, no, that's something. Yeah. Possible. Um, yep. Maybe don't. Oh, in fact, I remember a very specific situation where that exact thing happened. When, in fact, I was just thinking in my mind about us walking down to the paddock at the bottom of the place where I grew up, and yeah, we had one night where. We'd been drinking a little bit. We'd gone down to that paddock, and some, one of the guys did break there. We had to carry him. It was like 120 kilos over barbed wire fences. Um, I, probably at common law. Um, the police, of course, always have 
this justification to go in and do things if they have a reasonable suspicion in terms of doing stuff. So if they're standing there and they hear somebody screaming, um, you know, blood curdling screams to do that. But no, I, did this, I, I don't think there's a statutory definition for it. Um, there probably is in terms of common law. I haven't put it here though, um, in terms of that justification for doing it. Um, usually things like that with these duties to prevent harm um, that would come up. If you had a competing duty, but generally, uh, generally no, generally no. We don't have a lot of. We actually don't have a lot of rights to go and interfere with other people, um, just because we we think there's some overarching reason. Um, to, there is like when I mean, you're right in terms of the duty to uh, to save life and limb, and so there's a lot of excuses that people get to get off stuff. But what you find in the criminal sense, usually those excuses limit your criminal responsibility. So you don't, won't be done for criminal trespass, but it doesn't say anything about tort. Tort's still left there. So it's not uncommon to see that in the criminal code where it says a, there's a difference between something is lawful and something a person is not criminally responsible for this. Um, so an example is um, an extraordinary emergency in section 25 of the Queensland Criminal Code. It says a person is not criminally responsible if they have to do something which an ordinary person would you know, would have done the same in that situation. Oh, you know, uh, I'm my. I think my brother's about to get stabbed. I'm quickly driving to that house to try and save him. For example, all right. You are not criminally responsible. But you can be held civilly responsible for stuff. You know, if I'm driving really, really fast, something falls off my car and hurts somebody. They're still going to be able to sue me. Um, Sorry if that muddies the water a little bit because I don't have any specific case law to be able to answer that. I can go and have a look. So the 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 vegans. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they're all liable. So yeah. There's no lawful justification. Uh, it, it, it probably is criminal. It, is, it probably is, but it is definitely civil. If, yeah, yeah, the entity, all the people, the, the individuals that happen to be there. Oh, you've got problems with doing that. You've got to do things. And again, in trespass to land, you the farmers can do this and they can win. All right, but they're not going to get a large amount of dollars unless they prove that some other as we know there was some sort of harm that was caused so strictly speaking they'll get given a hundred dollars yes this person came onto your land they've infringed your rights as the landowner here's a hundred dollars or here's an award for them to pay you a hundred dollars and that is absolutely how that works in terms of criminal stuff usually there has to criminal trespass arises where there's an unlawful purpose and there again walking across the land um, probably wouldn't arise if they were just moving from a to b but if they were there to break stuff, yeah, they did all sorts, all sorts there, possibly. All of those things would come up, that's right. Um, tricky to do because the police have to actually charge them in order for that to be criminal. Okay. Oh, that's the next one. Yes, there is nuisance as well. Nuisance, though, is to do with the enjoyment of land. So you as the land owner, you get rights. You get a packet of rights to land. What are some packets of rights? So we'll do land in a few weeks, but couple of rights you get you get the right to enter your own land usually you get the right important right to um, alienate the land which is to sell it get some money you get the rights to profits from the land if there's crops or anything on it you get the rights to use it and sell it you get the rights to exclude other people from your land all right you get the right to create what we call lesser grants so for example lease your land out um, if you've got a, a piece of residential property you can rent it out you actually say i will limit my rights to enter sell that to you for 300 dollars a week to create a residential tenancy these are rights that you get and one of those rights you have is the lawful occupier so these are rights to the occupiers not to the owners the occupiers gets the right to uh, peace and quiet the quiet enjoyment of their land and that's you know, basically this idea of unreasonable interference to your quiet enjoyment is something you can seek compensation for under the tort of nuisance that's that's what that is that's the occupier the lawful occupiers of land can sue others if they and it, this is the sort of thing it's pretty broad how can you cause nuisance you can make a loud noise an unreasonable 
loud noise. And what the courts have said um, is that we pretty much follow the council guidelines for that. So Townsville is like hilarious. I don't know if you guys, who here has had to mow lawns? Who here has had to mow lawns at some stage in their life? In North Queensland. Who here had to mow lawns? Because I, I found it just, it's just interesting. Friends that I've had that have come from, from uh, developing countries I and mean, to come here and appreciate, you guys are probably aware, labor in Australia is real expensive. All right, labor stuff is cheap because Australian dollars are valuable. So if you're earning and working here, Australian dollars, the currency is really good. So stuff is cheap, but labor is expensive. And so as a result, you're far more likely to do things like mow your own lawns because it just costs too much. It costs, what was it like $120 to get somebody to come and mow your lawns? That's, yeah, a lot of money. Anyway, and the same with cleaning, um, cleaning houses. I don't know if you guys found, particularly for you guys that are relatively recent to Australia, um, it's really expensive to get people to come and clean your house. And I, I said, I'm friends from, um, from Gujarat and, and Rajasthan, and they just like, they're just not used to this at all. I'm like, what do you mean? We can't get people to come and clean it? I'm like, nah. Well, they do, and then they find out how they balk at the price. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, nuisance. So, unreasonable interference often goes with the council guidelines. The council guidelines do things like you can't mow your lawns after seven o'clock. That's unreasonable. Council's not actually f usually finding you directly. They usually, they can they have the power to, but usually they don't. Um, but they say here's the guidelines. And so you'll notice in Townsville, and particularly on a Saturday afternoon at about quarter to six. I don't know where you guys all live, but I live just around the corner in Douglas. 5.45 on a Saturday afternoon, you'll hear lawnmower going, and then another one, it's like this little thing that starts off, it's like the dogs barking, that one barks, and that one, and the lawnmowers all go off, because it's the sun's just going down, and it's not gonna take that long, because the properties aren't very big, and people know that, you know, about six, 6.30 is probably okay to be mowing the lawns, seven o'clock, not so much, not so much, that's when People are starting to have the dinner and stuff, and, and that's again, they don't. The common law doesn't prescribe these things. It doesn't say at one minute past seven, it's now a nuisance. But the council do. Councils do, and so the courts have said in more recent times we'll just follow their guidelines. They're much better at regulating this stuff than us. They have people that go around and check. All right, um, that's that. What else? There, conversion. A conversion is again is trespass to goods. It's when. <laughs> Per person willfully, which is not the same as intent, willfully um, deals with goods in a manner repugnant to the immediate right of possession of another. This is really technical language. This is the tort you use if somebody gets your stuff and they do something to it that you don't want. And that includes things like breaking it, moving it, twisting it, relocating it, repainting it, all of the things that you think of that you'd want to seek compensation for in relation to goods that you have the right of possession to. Not strictly speaking the owner, it's the person with the right to possession. Because goods, something like a, a car, for example, um, could be owned by the finance company. They're strictly speaking the owners. Um, the person who has the thing has that law for uh, rental cars. You know, again, strictly speaking, when you're driving a rental car, you actually have the right to, to sue somebody. That comes along and does something with it. If your mates come and they repaint your rental car, <laughs> the, um, well, rental car companies aren't too happy about that, but you as the person who has the immediate right to do that is the one that sues them in our system. That's called the tort of conversion. I'm um, sorry that there's a whole bunch of technical words for this. You can store these away somewhere. They're nowhere near as important as, as the, some of the things we did in contract law. Principle of Robinson and Harmon, remember that one? Tort of conversion? Yeah. If it comes up, know that you can, if you break someone else's stuff, the law can make you pay for it. Um, Detenue is similar to conversion, though, though it actually, for whatever reason, it's a separate court of action where you have something, a right to it, and you ask for it back, and it's not given back to you. Uh, you go to the tow truck company and say, you have my card, like it back, and they say, nah, not until you pay this, or whatever. Nah, wait, come back next week and ask again. That, strictly speaking, gives you a right and the, the thing is that the elements are slightly different. So detenue when a person unreasonably refuses to return goods um, is usually an easier thing to prove. You just have to prove you had this right to have the goods and that they, you asked for them and they refused. You can prove that it's unreasonable, done. You're gonna get some dollars. And when we're doing misrepresentation, um, I've mentioned to you guys that 
misrepresentation comes in a few different flavors. Remember, if you, if you manage to prove that somebody had misrepresentation, you get this right to terminate. You, can, you have to use quite quickly. But if the other party actually lied to you, um, they've made a representation, it is false, and, so, and you've suffered some harm as a result, you can also get a corresponding right to sue in tort. Remember, a representation that's made in the time of formation is not a term of a contract. You're not suing in contract law to get money. You're suing in tort under this tort here. And the whole idea of tort is to put you back to where you would have been. So if somebody has made a representation, they've lied to you about something that you've bought, you get a right to rescind the contract. If you either don't exercise that right or you're too late to rescind it because the property's gone to a third party, you can still sue the person who lied to you under this tort here. You have to prove harm, which is usually the hard part, but strictly speaking, you can, um, you can seek some form of compensation when people lie to you. All right, oh, we're going to take a break. Yes, take a break. And we'll come and talk about defamation after that. So sorry, but this is a little bit, uh, a lot of bits of information. Each individual tort is not important here. It's actually not important. The key bits at the start, those definitions, strict liability, vicarious liability, probably hand, handy to know those. But from this point forward in the lecture is the stuff that you do want to know about because they're the things that will actually more likely than not impact most of the businesses that you guys will be related to. So pause that now and we'll come back in a bit. Let me get some water.
Dun, dun, dun. Defamation. Yeah. Alright, there we go. Okay. Alright. This is an area of law which I have had many arguments about. I wholeheartedly recommend that you pay attention to this because I would be very surprised if it doesn't come up at some stage in your personal or private lives. And I will tell a cautionary tale, and that cautionary tale involves my mother, who, back in 2005, she's a, is a, is a hobby, she's a, a dog breeder. She's a dogs, dogs and breed spaniels. I grew up in a house that had all these stupid dumb dogs. I hate dogs. I don't like cats either. This is, I mutually just don't care. I don't, I don't care, I'm not either. We had a cat. I swear we had a cat and lots of dogs. And I don't care. Oh no, the worst. My cat is the worst. I would never have chosen him. He chose me. Okay. So my mother was a dog breeder. And that was what she did. It wasn't something that she we were intended to profit from. She was a hobby. She liked breeding spaniels. And she made some comments about another dog breeder as being a puppy farmer which apparently in the dog breeding world is a it's a disparaging comment uh, it means that maybe they have to pay tax or something i don't know but nonetheless this particular person took offense to that and my mum said doesn't matter because it's true well here is your first lesson about any person that tells you that something doesn't matter because it's true. Because in the technical sense, they're right. But there's one very important legal point that needs to be made here, and that is the onus of proving whether something is true. Because it is really hard to prove, if you call someone a B-I-T-C-H, that they actually are. You, as the person, who's said the nasty thing is the person that has to prove that something's true. The other side only has to prove these things. They have to prove that their um, that information's been communicated, that information identifies the particular person, and it either injures their reputation, causes them to be subject to, oh, what's the lovely words they use? Oh, sorry, causing them to be subject to hatred, contempt, or ridicule causes people to shun them or lowers their esteem in the eyes of the community. Um, so, is there anything there about truth? No. Truth is, is a defense to defamation, but it must be proved by the person defending. That's huge. That's a really huge thing. All right. And so, yes, so my mother and my father was also extremely grumpy because his name was on the email signature on the bottom. It was Gary and Shelley. And so he was really grumpy being sued. And they, yeah, they had to cough up collectively $20,000 for that, for that comment. So that is life. Anyway, all right. So just make note, it can, um, it can uh, when we're thinking about things that can be defamatory, this is the key part. This bit here at the top, it's, there's information, it's gone to a third party, and it really, it's all about lowering the reputation. Defamation is about reputation, and from an economic perspective, reputation has an economic value. So even though there is, and we sort of have, defamation is one of those odd torts, because you've got this idea of the person. We, as people, you know, have liberty. We're not to be touched. We're not to be deprived of this liberty. And we are not to be ridiculed as part of it too. Each person is considered to be worthy in some way. All right, so you've got that aspect. But you've also got the economic aspect. If you, for example, are a barrister and you're renowned for being appallingly bad at your job and lying, are you going to get much work? No, no you won't. Um, if you are a, an electrician and you, the rumor goes around 
that you, oh, I don't know, um, what are the terrible things that tradies do? They go and urinate in the kitchen thing, all those sorts of things. You hear these stories about terrible tradies. These are the sort of things that come up where um, people's reputation suffer. And there's a very strong connection between your reputation and your economic well-being. There's a dollar value associated with these things. This is an area of law which has gone up a lot. The dollar rewards have gone up a lot. Um, there's an uh, Australian actress called Rebel Wilson that, um, that who won a defamation uh, case in there, but her damages actually got reduced because the courts, the, the appellate courts, actually recognised the pendulum probably needs to swing back a little bit. These defamation awards have been ballooning in recent times. And so you just have to be a little bit mindful of that. All right, so defamation meaning can come from either the, um, the ordinary meaning of the words that are said, um, either a false innuendo or a true innu innuendo. So when you are, and again, going back to my mum, uh, that uh, actually calling somebody a puppy farmer, well, uh, the, the ordinary meaning of those words may have something, or there may be something hidden or somehow behind that, we're implying in some way that you have your puppies and you breed them in a farm-like environment. Um, and that may also still be defamatory if, in fact, that person has a farm and does have a lot of dogs that they seem to be doing and using farming-like practices to do that. All right. Even if, in, and this is the, the tricky part, even if some aspects of this are actually true as part of it, it still hurts the reputation. And again, I'll get back to the excuse, the excuse, but you're making an innuendo, what you're saying can actually be true in part, can still be defamatory. Um, so just make note, be really, really careful. The key takeaway from this, of course, don't say bad things that lower the reputation of other people. Because the bits, they really only need to prove that they've been harmed by your words. You have to do the rest. And that's tricky. That's a tricky thing to do. All right. Okay, so once you have proved the, the, those three things, so it's either it's one, two, three, and then one of those under 3A, 3B, it's essentially basically your reputation has been damaged. If you've proved those three things, the other side, so this bit here, the defendant bears the onus of establishing one of these defenses. So you've succeeded in the elements. If you rock up to court, because of, in terms of the way an onus works, if the other side doesn't turn up to court, they get the wrong court date. Not going to prove it, are they? They weren't even there to raise any form of evidence to the contrary, you're going to win. You will just win. If, they are, if you prove that your reputation has been harmed and the other side doesn't bother turning up, they bear the onus of discharging that. If they don't turn up, you literally can't lose just by the mechanics of these things. The other side has to turn up and they have to prove one of these things. Okay, um, uh, some of these are easier to prove than others. Um, Justification. You have to prove. You would have to prove that a particular um, innuation or statement that is made was somehow justified in that particular set of circumstances, and those circumstances are very narrow. Um, trying to think, in the context here, for example, of um, the puppy farming, would be something if there was a, a narrow set of circumstances, and that you needed to inform people who were seeking to do these things who were specifically not wanting to get puppies from a particular puppy farmer of some particular description. I'm not even sure that's a very good example. It's even narrower than that. I'll come back. I'll have to think about some examples of that. Um, contextual truth, by the way, is essentially proving that something's true. If you can, and it's a little bit wider than just proving something's absolutely true, if you can prove that in the in relating to this set of circumstances, um, so going back to the puppy farming example, that the I mean, my mum in this situation would have to prove that within a certain period of time, that particular dog breeder actually did breed and sell a, um, a massive amount of puppies that got on sold. 
in that sort of situation. You possibly, for, if they could prove between that period of time, she might be able to prove that and, and uh, maybe justify that in terms of it counting as farming. I'm not sure, but it's still hard to do. It's still actually hard to go about finding the evidence in order to actually prove to the court on balance of probabilities that this thing in these set of circumstances was actually sufficiently true. Um, absolute privilege, you can say whatever you like. If you are a member of parliament talking in the houses of parliament, or um, you've got qualified, you've got qualified privilege as well. Uh, also, if you are in court, and you're adducing evidence. You can't be sued for defamation while you're adducing evidence in court. You gotta let it all out. Go to it. Um, publication of public documents. Uh, public documents are things that have been usually retrieved with things like freedom of information or released at some stage. Um, and those that things that are going published, it's not defamatory. You actually, it's quite tricky to defame public bodies. It can be done but it's quite, generally quite tricky to do. It has to work in some very narrow set of circumstances, like if some government bonds are outsourced to some small entity or something. Yeah, not, not very easy to do. Um, fair report of proceedings of public concern. Um, if there are, and these things can do be things like minutes of a, um, uh, like a non-for-profit body, which isn't, strictly speaking, a public body, Right. Normally, if you have a group of people together and they have their minutes, that doesn't get released to the public. Um, but if there is some tangential public matter that's involved with this, and the hilarious one, I was this close, this close to actually suing a former student of mine. Do you want to hear this story? No, you guys probably don't want to hear this story. Don't say bad things about people in the Law Student Society Facebook group because, again, if I only have to prove that the nasty thing was said about me in terms of my ability to read statutes, it was. And, yeah, um, oh, the strangle there. <coughs> Former student of mine had got some information secondhand. I actually had an argument with, uh, it was actually a peer, so she went through law at the same time as me, who's now a solicitor, She's the daughter of one of the barristers. Uh, and we had a very loud, well, not very loud, we had a bit of an altercation. We don't really get on that well. Um, just outside here, it's at Building 27. It was to do with the student barbecue. And I happened to make the point, and I was a little bit grumpy at the moment, about students that don't actually go and read the legislation before making assertions. Because you guys are probably aware what it's like when you have these sorts of um, clicky uh, incorporated societies. And the law students are the worst because they all think they know everything about the law. So they say, you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do that. And they don't know anything anyway. It's very, very frustrating. But anyway, I had made the point about them not reading statutes and that not actually going and looking at the barbecue reg regulations, going to the council website, going into the food aid, going into the stuff. And I had an argument and said with a, a peer of mine, this is going back about six, seven years. And anyway, the student that I'd had 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 secondhand taken what the person who doesn't get on with me very well had said and then published this horrible series about how I didn't know how to read a statute. It was just awful. Posted it all up on Facebook and I'm like, you are aware that the rules of evidence say that the person that I was talking to, you can say this about me, right? You can do whatever you like, but this harms my reputation, okay? And you as the person publishing this weren't privy to this conversation that we were that we had and so all of the things you've written in here about what this person said you're going to have to get her to actually come to court to actually prove that this was con contextually true and she is not going to turn up to court on your behalf and so faced with something of a dilemma because again a mature age student older than me was faced with something of a dilemma because she'd clearly said something which harmed my reputation and would have absolutely no mechanism for actually proving it, proving that it was true. So, and I, again, only have to rock up to court and say, this was published, 
this was addressed to these people and it hurt my reputation and that's it um, and so I'd like some dollars uh, I didn't do that I just got the collective people in the law student society to say this needs to be removed and we won't speak of it ever again I speak of it again because it's a good example of something pretty close to defamation um, but I'm a relatively robust character and uh, but just be, you know, be mindful others can be a little bit quicker to litigate other people can be a little bit faster as my mum found out all right uh, qualified privilege is things to do with um, uh, when you're giving information to uh, people like your medical and legal practitioners in terms of that information things that have to be broadcast if you tell your lawyer something all right and in the context of the law firm they have to talk to other people in that law firm about that particular legal thing and the fact that something ends up they find out something about you that they didn't know and it suffers your, your reputation to be lost well that's too bad that's just the systems we have in place for doing those things um, innocent dissemination if something accidentally gets sent out all right uh, let's see if we can just go back a slide Go back a slide. Oops. All right. You'll notice that in this, oh, the earlier slide, the previous one, it um, doesn't actually talk about the mechanism for doing it. It doesn't actually say whether a person intended to cause harm. Um, it's just the injuring of reputation. So it says. Uh, the particular person, the defendant in this case, has communicated information. All right, has communicated so that if you have information which is harmful to someone's reputation, and you as the defendant can prove that you didn't actually mean to have this published in some way, it accidentally um, was disseminated to the third party. All right then you can actually use that as an excuse. It's pretty hard, it's pretty narrow. You're the one who has to prove all of those steps, but it can be done. It can be done, and it does actually offer an excuse under this. This is not, strictly speaking, an intentional tort. All right, it's, um... All right, go back to this one. And the final one is triviality. Uh, for those, the, the, this earlier specific talks, all the talks of trespass and assault, the battery and all of those things. Look, you actually, they're, they're what's called actionable per se. If somebody whacks you without consent, lawful justification, then you can go and seek a remedy in the court. Here's $10, go away. However, if in this situation, the actual harm done is really, really small. And again, this, this is an excuse that has to be raised by the defendant. All right, so the plaintiff's already proved that they've been subject to some form of ridicule, the reputation's been lowered in some way. Um, but if you can turn around and actually argue back, Your Honor, actually, it was only a trivial amount, um, or the economic harm that came from this is only a really small amount, that, that, that can do it. And um, also note, there's a bunch of um, common law defences here as well. And so, again, going back to our mate Pat Coleman, the former JCU law student, so he wasn't, it wasn't a defamation matter, but they did say, we have an implied right of political communication. Um, ABC and Longy, Longy was the um, New Zealand Prime Minister in the 80s, and he, uh, the ABC published something about him he didn't really like very much. And, um, and they said that, look, in relation to politics, too bad. Um, Longy actually, he lost and he had to pay costs. In fact, I read his autobiography a few years ago, uh, and he uh, he actually only went back and served two more terms as member of parliament. He only did that to pay that bill. Funny, eh? He carried on working just to do it, and it's kind of bad if your public figures are only doing this to, for money. Like I don't know, just like, to me, I, that, that something about it felt really wrong. Anyway, all right, that's it. That's the end of the the narrow or the specific torts. Now we're going to look at the important one, which is negligence. We need to know how this works. 
functionally, you have to understand this tool. This is the most important one. It's complex and it requires a little bit of thought to get your head around. Um, but this idea of negligence, really, it, I mean, in the simpler sense, it's three elements. You just need to prove. And I'll try and explain this in multiple different ways because, again, as a person coming from an accounting background, I had a hard time with this. And I'm hoping I can explain this better than it was explained to me. But it goes like this. If you can prove that somebody owes you a duty of care, all right, a duty of care at law, all right, and the appropriate amount of care that duty entails, that party has fallen below that appropriate standard. And this breach, this falling below that standard, has caused you some harm you can seek compensation for them. That is the tort of negligence in a sentence or two. All right, so I'll explain that again a few times. If a legal duty or duty of care is owed to you by someone else, all right, if there is a duty of care, the law says if a duty of care exists, there must be some abstract standard of care that, that flows from this. All right. If I am a driver, the standard of care is going to be that appropriate to a reasonably competent, open, licensed driver. That is the appropriate standard of care. And when thinking about what that is, well, okay, what do they do? They, ch they check their vehicle before they get in it to make sure it's not defective. They drive at the speed limit or under, at or under the speed limit. They slow down when there are traffic hazards around. They have their windscreen wipers on, they, they are careful with acrophane, they do all of these things. This is the appropriate standard of care. We owe other motorists a duty of care at law. All right, it's an appropriate standard of care. And if one day, and as a matter of fact, you fell below that standard, and as a result of falling under that standard, harm came to somebody else, they can seek compensation to put them back in the situation they would have been in. So going back to the driver, if I'm driving along, and again, we all assume that Jean's another motorist, I'm a motorist, Jean's a motorist, I owe her a duty of care as a fellow motorist in law. I just do. All right, that's what's called an established category. And the standard of care that I owe is to not break the road rules, to not um, speed, to not drive drunk, not do all of those things. So if I fell below that standard by speeding. If I'm doing 75 in a 60 zone, all right, and a rabbit jumps out of it and I swerve, crash, all right, I've fallen below that standard of care. Fallen below that. And if me falling below that standard of care, going too fast, has, and again, Jean would have to prove this, has caused her loss or her harm then I have to compensate her to put her back in the position she ought to have been in. Or sorry, back in the position she was in as best that money can. If she's got a broken leg and that leg will never be right, I can only give enough dollars to make it right. I can't actually unbreak the leg. Okay, so the key thing to note here, in the lay sense in this example, what would be the word we would describe? A rabbit coming out in front of the road? accident. You have to remove the thought of accident in your mind when we're analyzing this stuff because from a lawyer's perspective, we don't care about accidents. Accidents don't have things. What we care about is who has to pay for it? Yes, there's been an accident. There's been a crash. Two cars have been wrecked and, and there's some personal injury on both sides. Who pays for it? That's the bit that we care about. And that is why the tort of negligence exists and that is why it is such an important area in this um, this topic because we as as accounting types are going to be charged with analyzing this stuff how much are we going to get how much does our insurance have to be because let's face it most of the time 99 percent of the time it's not individuals even though me and jean in theory would be suing me in practice though jean's insurer would be suing my insurer they're stepping in our shoes buying that risk off us oh we're buying switching things over for the regular payment of money Okay, um, also note that this is a common law set of rules. So there's things I described are from the common law, but the Civil Liabilities Act actually goes through and maps out some of them. 
and explains them. It doesn't talk about duty of care much, but it does talk about um, the, the standard of care, um, largely because judges kept arguing about what those words meant for a long time. And they said, let's just map it out. But it's not codified. All right, so there's three elements. The first element really falls into two halves. Either you're in an established category, or if you're not an established category, whether one can be made up on the facts. That will only happen, again, if there's some reasonable facility, uh, for, for the reasonable foreseeability of harm to another person, party. Uh, and we're not going to create duties for everybody everywhere. So you have to, this policy consideration comes into it. And I'll, I'll talk about the salient features um, as well. Now, the key thing to note here, this established category where judges in the past have said that doctors owe their patients a duty of care. Solicitors owe their clients a duty of care. Do accountants owe their clients a duty of care? Yeah, of course they do. What sort of things does the duty pay? If you're an accountant, and the advice that you give your client is that, uh, oh, hang on, I'm trying to think with different types of accountants. Say you're an auditor, and you're going through, audit the books, and go, yeah, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Tick and sign it off. And it turns out that somebody had been siphoning off hundreds of thousands of dollars and nobody would be checking it and the cross checks were terrible. What would the business be able to do? They'd be able to sue. What's the area of law they sue in? Negligence. Why? Because you as the auditor owe your client a duty of care. Don't get me wrong. You also have in that situation, what other duties? Ninety-nine percent of the time, what's the legal relationship between an auditor and a, uh, we'll say, a company? Well, they're independent. Yeah, that's right. So, what's the mechanism we use in order to get? If we want an auditor. What do we do? We enter into a contract. So there are contractual duties, and part of doing that is that you have a contractual duty to not. Be a terrible auditor. Usually, again, you put whatever you like in your contract. And auditors, for example, if you go through Ernst & Young, they've got a lot more bargaining power than we do. So they're probably going to put in the contract, we won't be held responsible for this if, if things are wrong because uh, we've got the bargaining power. And that exclusion clause will apply to contract and to tort. But assuming that for whatever reason we can't sue in contract, and this, this actually has come up twice, this came up for me in legal practice, in situations where advice was given, financial advice was given to, to a person, and the advice was bad. Trouble is, <laughs> the um, when you're trying to determine what the relevant time is in terms of the breach of contract, that's at the time the negligent advice is given. All right, and that's the relevant time for the Limitation of Actions Act, six years from the breach. So guess what happened? The advice was given here, but it took years before the harm happened. And in tort, the relevant time is when the harm happened. So what we had is a situation where we could sue in the tort of negligence, but we couldn't sue for breach of contract um, because that time limit had expired. So these things can come up. Um, that's, that's one area. Okay. So, again, going back to us as accountants, we as accountants, uh, again, I'm thinking narrowly, I'm thinking auditors here, we will usually engage with our clients and have a contract and have it mapped out what we will and won't be liable for. But that's not always the case. Not always the case. It's not a, uh, what are some situations where um, auditors operate to check books where they're not getting paid? What are some examples? Yeah. That's right. Um, the law JCU law student, well, JCU law student actually did have to pay someone, but, uh, 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 but particularly, and you guys may find this too, if you're, if you're in Australia for a really long time and you have accounting skills, all of the non-for-profits groups will always want to use your skills for this, that, and the other thing. Um, a friend of mine's on the committee for the North Queensland um, Hindu Association, and they have just by coincidence they've got a whole bunch of accountants that can just go and, and help to go and, and do those uh, books uh, for them um, okay so the 
the other way that this thing comes out, and this is where this sort of negligence gets really tricky, is that if there's not this established category, you can still prove that someone owes you a duty of care. And look, these situations, that this is the relatively recent one. So the case there is this Donahue and Stevenson. This case was from 19, well, I think it happened in the late 1920s. It went something like this. Uh, two ladies in Scotland traveled to Paisley, I think it is, some town in Scotland, and they went to purchase two ginger beers. And one lady bought the other one a bottle of ginger beer, and she drank half of the bottle, all right, and then drank it, having a lovely conversation, and then got to the end of it, and then poured the rest into a glass, and there was a decomposed snail in, in the bottle. And, uh, and that came out. She was all, uh, I feel sick. And so the, the key thing to note there is that the law up until that point did not allow a person to sue in that situation. It was either an established category, right? Solicitor, patient, not solicitor, patient, doctor, patient, solicitor, client, and so on and so on. Driver, passenger, drivers to other drivers, and, and, and so on. And um, uh, occupiers of, owners of land and occupiers of land. These are all established categories of care. The courts have said for a long, long, long time, yes, that exists. But in the case of the snail, right, what was the appropriate law to use? Well, it wasn't contract law. Why? Because the woman who suffered the injury wasn't the one who bought the drink. Okay, and so as a result, the doctrine of privity applies. The lady that drank the drink can't sue or be sued on the contract. She wasn't part of it. She didn't offer any consideration as part of that contract. So contract law was out. It could not happen. And so this went all the way to their appellate courts and they, they said that, look, we, from this point forward, actually accept from time to time, we're going to have to make things up on the fly when people are, again, where there is some reasonably foreseeable risk of harm to others who could be affected by your actions. All right? This is actually a pretty hard thing to note. So up until Donahue and Stevenson, the tort of negligence did exist, but only for established categories. Only for those ones that I talked about. Solicitor, client, doctor, patient. There's a whole bunch of them. After those, that case, these things started to be mapped out a little bit more. And so um, Graham Buckley Oysters and Ryan, for example, was some guys who owned a, um, an oyster farm. And the question is, was somebody who was flushing things down a river further or far away, was that... Did they owe other people in and around that river a duty of care? Because strictly speaking, it's not an established category. And what the court said is, look, you have to look at all of the factors that relate to this. What things would actually point towards this, again, for good public policy, actually establishing a duty here at law to actually make people do stuff? Look, the law doesn't like imposing duties on citizens. If you think about it, that's duties... That's the hallmark of tyranny. The idea of your government telling you, government or your courts or whoever, telling you that you have a duty to do things. You have a duty to jump because we tell you. That is not the hallmark of a decent society. All right, We only do this very reluctantly. And the courts, again, came up with these things very reluctantly. But they do accept that people, if they've left their own devices, would cause harm all over the show. And so sometimes people would do things and create... You guys in economics remember negative externalities? Remember? Ne do you guys... Who has done economics? I think I've asked this question before. One? Come on. Must be... Really? Do you guys know how to do economics as part of the MBA? Oh, next semester. Ah, oh, okay. There you go. Well, when you do economics, you'll do um, negative ne externalities. The idea that you um, have your factory, for example, and it produces pollution. Who pays for that? You think about it, then the great challenge of our generation is, of course, climate change because it's all to do with negative externalities. If you as a country or you as a person or you as a, 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 a company are polluting the air, you don't have to pay for that. There's no carbon tax. There's no way of doing that. So everybody collectively suffers a little bit as a result. No one pays for it. That's a negative externality. Um, and I found an example of a positive externality. My neighbours have this lovely gun. They fertilise it and they do all 
they're all very garden conscious. But the land slopes slightly towards ours. So all of the lovely fertilizer and stuff they have in there actually comes down to my son's lemon tree, which is all massive as a result. That's a positive externality. They're doing something which they're not getting the benefit from that does good things elsewhere. That's pretty rare. Usually it's the other way around. Um, and, but we accept that this happens all the time. And so the courts have had to be a little bit more flexible as time goes by. But assuming that there is a duty of care, so what? Okay, duty of care is that. Yes, I owe, me as a solicitor, I owe my client a duty of care. What does that actually mean? And that is really to do with this second element. This idea of the appropriate standard of care. Because this standard is actually an abstract standard that a judge will determine. And they will do things by thinking about me as a solicitor and um, I've got my client. What are the things that are a reasonably competent solicitor, lawyer in my case, would do? Well, they would probably um, you know, ask that whether the client has got any other form of legal representation. Ask whether the client, I'm trying to think of a specific matter, um, uh, we'll say a person's come in and they've got, uh, oh, I think of a real example, a, um, what's the word, uh, a debt that's owed to them. Say there's a $100,000 debt. The person comes to me and says, let's advise us, and I give advice as to how they can um, have this debt enforced. And I give also, well, what things would a reasonably competent solicitor do? Well, they would probably check to see whether this particular um, thing is valid. They would also check to see whether or not the other side had been released from that debt. They would also check to see whether, whether the documents are all legitimate. They would check to see whether, um, uh, literally call the courthouse to find out what the, court, the dates are for these things. You do a whole bunch of little steps that a reasonably competent professional solicitor would go through and do. All right, that is an abstract standard. That's an abstract standard. This is the first component of, of breach. That is not what actually happened. Or maybe it is. Maybe I did go through and do all those things. If I did go through and do all those things, my standard was this, uh, my actual, actual standard was that, then I didn't breach. Because the breach is only when what you actually did fell below what you were supposed to do. That, that's really the, the key um, aspect of this element. They, they work out what an abstract, not perfect, by the way, not what a perfect lawyer would have done, what a reasonably competent person would do. Um, or in the case of these duties for um, these specific categories, what a reasonably competent driver would do, what a reasonably competent auditor would do. They will come up with a list of things. You know, and again, going back to the driving example, reasonably competent driver checks the vehicle to make sure it's defects, makes sure the windscreen's clean, drives it up to the speed limit, slows down when there's um, clear, obvious traffic hazards, and so on and so on and so on. Boring as. A reasonably competent open driver's license uh, driver is boring. And that's okay. That's, that's fine. That's when we're determining these things. Um, also note with driving in particular, it's actually unusual that um, the used to be that for learner drivers, the standard was of a reasonably competent learner driver, and they actually changed that. So learner drivers are actually held at the same standard as um, uh, competent open driver's license, even though they're not most of them aren't capable of being at that standard. The law says, in terms of the duty of care, it's up here. Which sounds a little bit strange, doesn't it? You're actually imposing a duty on learner drivers to operate at a higher standard than they're capable of doing. A bit quirky that one but if you think about it from a policy perspective if i crash into jean and i'm a teenager from her perspective well, well, she doesn't care when you're driving along on the road you have to be you know you're sure the car's got little p plates and all that in it but we just still have to expect when we're doing things for them to actually be competent just don't okay now when determining what those factors are, this is actually mapped out in the Civil Liabilities Act. They ask what, a, what um, a reasonable person would have taken in that situation. These are mapped out in the Civil Liabilities Act. And so that if you're doing this and explaining it for your tort problem, you'll probably be needing to talk about that and actually using those sections from the Civil Liabilities Act. 
So they look at, when analyzing this stuff, what's the probability of harm? What's the likely seriousness of any harm that it has caused? How much does it cost to take precautions? And what's the social utility? What social means is how good as an activity um, is the thing that creates the risk? And so the, the classic example that comes from um, Lord Denning talking about cricket and how, and it's this lovely flowery language when you're analyzing the social utility of the risk. He was talking about a fence at the end of a cricket ground and how only two people in the last five years had hit a six beyond the, those fences. And they, when reading this judgment, it's like, oh, the lovely village greens of central England in the middle of summer and the birds are singing and telling us all this about the great things, the, the, um, the great social utility that comes from um, this particular activity. That's something that does get taken into account. Um, what's some other examples? Uh, yeah, cricket. There's a case, oh, I yeah, I'll come back to it later, but it's um, uh, indoor cricket. Turns out indoor cricket's actually pretty dangerous. Yeah, don't play indoor cricket without a helmet. That's pretty stupid. Um, so they, when they're going through and you're looking at what the appropriate standard of care of the people that run an indoor cricket um, arena, um, taking these things into account, what's the likelihood of, of harm? Reasonably high. Likely seriousness of getting a ball at your head at 100 kilometers an hour, pretty high one might think, pretty high. Cost of taking precautions, oh, there's a little bit, but it's not too much. Uh, what do you do, give them helmets, give them some training, put signs everywhere, have nets, have padded stuff, and have a uh, rubber ball. And social utility of the activity creating the risk itself. We argue that sport, and this is Australia, I guess New Zealand as well, um, culturally specific, in Australia, sport is considered to have a lot of social utility. So as such, a lot of the activities around sport will have this taken into account in terms of the precautions. But sport, um, sporting bodies are still going to be liable. Remember that this is we're just determining what the standard is. They still have a duty of care when you're determining what that is. They do take into account that look we are actually not going to make it that to play soccer in the field over there you have to wear full battle armor that costs a lot which is item you know subsection c and there's a lot of social utility and people getting a bit muddy so we'll take that into account as well these are the factors that see, the court takes into account when trying to determine what a reasonably competent student association would have running sport events over here um, because once they've determined what that is, and taken cost into account, um, what are the cost factors, by the way, in, in relation to this accident I had with Jean? What's the cost factors for me driving at 60? Uh, nothing. I just drive at 60. There's no, when you're trying to determine what an appropriate standard of care is, walking around my car, checking that the windows are washed, and driving at the speed limit doesn't cost me anything, essentially. There's no massive amount of. Um, money that needs to be spent here. Now this would be different, for example, if I was the um, park operators of, if I'm going to Cockatoo Creek tomorrow, up in Alligator Creek. You guys, have any of you guys been up there? It's really nice, it's really nice. Alligator Creek, go for a walk. Um, but you can't put big hazard warning signs at every single hazardous spot. It would cost way too much money and you'd have to go through and get somebody to maintain them all. It's, um, it's just too expensive. A sign at the front that says, hey, look, there are hazards here, here, and here. Don't climb the waterfall. Don't go through this place after six o'clock at night. Don't do this. Don't do that. That's probably going to be fine because it's um, the cost of actually putting a barrier around all of the hazards in that entire thing is way too much. Way, 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 way too much. And so those are the things that are taken into account. This, by the way, this you will be examined on. This is the sort of question that comes up. Having to do this analysis it requires you guys to think. And when you're doing your exam, you'll be given a scenario and it'll be a question like that. Okay, we're a parks authority. What are the sort of things, taking into account each of these factors, would a reasonably competent parks authority do in order to stop harm in and around this river? You know, should they have to have lighting? Should they have a sign? Should they have a person that guards the gate? Should they close the, the closing gate at the very start? What, are the, what would a reasonably competent parks authority do in that situation? Because all of these things, all of these cases and scenarios end 
with somebody with a broken neck and who's paralyzed because he, you know, I'll, I'll use a gender pronoun because almost invariably he has jumped in head first into shallow water. Oh no, there was no sign. And they're horrible actually. Studying this stuff in tort law is horrible. There's a whole series of cases where these things happen. I actually have a friend who was a paramedic in the army. This is actually on the army, sorry. He was with the Queensland government at the time. And this is, I, I think, a really pertinent matter. He was doing a rescue 100 nautical miles off the Cape. And he's the paramedic that goes down in the winch in the helicopter. It was a storm. This guy was very, a Polish guy was very, very sick on this boat and needed to be urgently winched out. So Jamie went down on this thing and the storm picked up. And the storm, and so the helicopter is now shaking. He's now down on the rope. The thing is shaking. And the pilot and the co pilot and the helicopter are now faced with a very, very unenviable moment where they have to decide we are going to crash if we don't cut the winch. And so they cut the winch. And he fell 50 meters and he's now tetraplegic. Can't, he's got a little bit of movement in his fingers. Yeah. Uh, what's the difference between what area of law would this fall under? Is that negligence? No, it's an intentional tort. Um, they've done it, to, you know, the circumstances, you know, what hell have you, but it essentially it's been done to the right. Let's just say the Queensland government compensated Jamie quite considerably um, as a result of doing this. Still, again, no amount of money. No amount of money will ever be worth um, that. But again, they're obliged to do as best they can to do that. Um, I couldn't tell you whether it was seven digits or eight. I don't know. Um, but it's an intentional tour. Anyway, that was very sad. All right, so just make note, once you've worked out what, after, you, and again, you guys will have to do this in your exam. When you've done this thing, you've, you've looked at these things, taken into account the probability of harm, taken into account the likely seriousness of, of an event happening. Because again, if you're going back to your parks, if only one person goes in there a year, the likelihood of harm is really low. Really, really, really low. If the only people that go, you know, enter into your big block of land are fully trained geologists with all of their proper equipment doing exploration, very, very unlikely that, um, that they're going to get harmed when doing these things. It's a rare event is the cost, and again, public bodies are not vessels with unlimited funds. And sometimes, and this is really unfortunate, sometimes the council in situations where they're getting sued comes up and says, look, we, we, we couldn't afford to do this. We couldn't have done it. Put signs next to all of these things. And again, social utility. And once you've done that, you've worked out what the subtract standard is, then look and see what actually happened. That's, that second bit is really easy. Here's the abstract standard. They've fallen below it. And this bit is the bit that we have to analyze at this point because that part is the breach. Once we have established that breach, then we've got to prove that, that falling below the standard caused the harm. So in the case of Jean and me, this car crash, she's proved that I've breached by doing 75 and a 50 zone. She then has to prove, uh, again, using some of these tests, which actually reads slightly different to contract law. Contract law, they use a very simple but for test modified by common sense. Here, we do start with our common sense test. We use an ordinary test. And remember, any of these tests will succeed. So if Jean in this situation could prove any of these, she's going to be fine. Whether an ordinary or reasonable person would think, would associate this breach with leading to that harm. All right, that's the common sense test. Um, you can also use the test from contract law. Would the harm have come but for the breach? Would Jean have suffered this injury but for me exceeding the speed limit by 25 kilometers an hour? Um, again, she'd have to prove that and balance probabilities. Or, and this Amaka and Booth came from um, the asbestos cases. There's a the trouble with the asbestos. You guys know what asbestos is? Asbestos? No, it doesn't ring a bell. It's, a, it's quite an Australian thing. Asbestos is a naturally formed uh, com compound? compound. It's a blue rock, right? And it comes up in, um, you can get it when you're digging for things like copper. You can have, occasionally you'll just get uh, seams of asbestos is a blue substance but the trouble was if you went back 50 years asbestos is really fire retardant so <laughs> it's really good for putting in walls to stop fires so you could put a thin a 
thin board of asbestos would fireproof. Fires couldn't move between rooms. So they used it as a building product. However, the trouble with asbestos is that the individual fibers that make up the stuff are long. And if you breathe them in, they absolutely destroy your lungs. And the trouble with asbestos or asbestosis, which is the condition that, that can't flowed from this, is that you can breathe in one asbestos, literally just go, <sighs> breathe it in, and you can get asbestosis in your lungs and you can be wrecked forever. You get that? Or, and this is the unfortunate part, you can literally work in the asbestos mine for 20 years and not get asbestosis. And that is a real problem for the legal test of causation. Why? Because James Hardy, the guys, you know, the building materials people, would just wheel out the guy who'd been working there for 20 years and say to the court, you, the person that's, that worked there for a year, can't say that this was caused by asbestos. It might have just been bad luck. This guy's been working there 20 years and he doesn't have it. You know, what are you going to do? And the courts were right. They said that, look, we actually have no legal way of doing this. And so it wasn't until later, again, this, um, Mark and Ruth was uh, the Australian equivalent of an earlier English case, Fairchild, where they said that we actually do need to change this test for causation. In some situations where, look, it's patently obvious that there is a real material and substantial contribution towards this harm, that is going to be fine. If it's materially and substantially contributed to the harm, that will be fine as the test of causation in those situations. So that's, again, it's only a relative version. That's only like not even 10 years old in Australia. Um, it's usually you'll start with the but-for test. And I just point this out from legal practice perspective. This element of negligence is without any shadow of doubt the hardest one to prove. Proving that even if the person who did the naughty thing, when they fell below the standard, you are the one who has to prove that them, if and this is the hard bit. If they'd done all of those things, right, you then have to prove that you wouldn't have suffered this harm. If, for example, I'd been doing 50 kilometers an hour. Um, there is another test that you have to hear, this test of remoteness. Um, the Wagon Mound case, there's a bunch of these cases. Uh, the first one, this involved in Sydney Harbour, a bit unfortunate really. There were some, um, uh, it was a boat on one side of the harbour and it dropped, I think you call it bunker oil, Dropped oil, as you do, I don't, for whatever reason, jumped oil in the harbour. And the oil floated across the harbour. And so there were some guys on another boat on the other side of the harbour over dock. And they were doing some welding. And there was some welding. There was some cotton in the water and it got in the oil. And for whatever reason, the welding came in the oil, did this. And it blew up two massive steamships and the wharf. Whole thing. Very expensive exercise here. And the issue was, well, was that this series of steps going to be so far removed from the original active negligence to drop the oil. And there they said, no, it was an unbroken chain in that situation. These things, it was um, not too remote, even if it wasn't you know, reasonably foreseeable necessarily. That, that test for remoteness, it was still a direct unbroken chain. There was no intervening act in between those things. And that's the wagon man number one. And, uh, and so you just have to make note of this. So if you're doing this test in the exam and you'll get this question in your exam, you will have to just mention that. It'll be worth a mark. All right, finally, in the last half hour, I'm going to talk about damages. I think I've only got two slides left. Yes, only two slides left after this one. Oh, that's why that's not working. Oh, that's why. So, no, I'm going to take that back. So my slides are actually out of order. I'm really sorry about this. It's not damages yet. It's this. Oh, that was a little bit too early. Sorry about that. Um, just before I move on, you can, as the defendant, provide some mechanism for you to either de defeat a claim or have your damages reduced? Um, and the first one of those, which is really hard to prove, is the Valenti rule. Valenti non fit injuria. Oh, I should have the word fit in there somewhere. And that means, basically, a person can't sue a negligence if they knowingly, with open eyes, 
knew about the, the, the harm or the potential for harm and willingly and willfully engaged in the conduct anyway. They bore the risk of harm upon themselves. It is a high bar. So don't think when people you know, comes into your store and they slip and fall that you're going to be able to argue this. And so the example here is Woods and Multi Port Solons, which was the indoor cricket case. They tried to argue and failed that people playing indoor cricket are going to um, consent to that or voluntarily engage in this uh, hazardous activity. And they said that, look, that is probably true of professional cricketers. All right. If um, I was watching Imran Khan, I think that was the example he used actually in this case, um, was going, if you get, you know, people that have been playing cricket for a really long time and then come in and play into a cricket and don't wear a helmet. Yeah, maybe. Maybe they are consenting to do that. But an ordinary member of the public who plays cricket occasionally, no. No, they're not going to have that. They're not going this with full and open eyes uh, in terms of the consequences. That's not going to be how that, that's going to work. It's, it's a pretty high bar to prove. Um, also, and this is this, um, this idea of the second one, is contributory negligence. Basically, you as the defendant can rock up to court and make an argument that in some way the plaintiff contributed to their own downfall. We can argue that in some way, so here for example, I'd be going to court to argue that in some way Jean was contributing to this. Possibly, maybe she was doing 60 in a 50 zone as part of this process. That would be up to me to try and do that in order to get the damage awards reduced. Now, interestingly, there is one very quirkily, very Queensland situation where your damages are automatically reduced by a minimum of 25%, and that is if you are intoxicated. And somewhere in the civil law, I don't have the section anymore, but if you have been drinking alcohol and you get hurt, by default, your damage award is reduced by 25%. You are deemed to be, and it's funny, I, I've looked at this and I've wondered, this applies to all matters. This involves, literally, it, it involves to all things, from professional negligence case for your auditor coming in, to slipping over in a supermarket, to driving a vehicle, to playing sport. There's just this default rule that says if you're, if you're intoxicated, damage awards reduced by 25%. It's curious, eh? Um, but the courts have discretion to move that up and down. The courts also have discretion with this contributory uh, damage awards to reduce it all the way to zero. So if you could actually literally go, like in inverted commas, win your case, and then the other side managed to argue, well, you actually contributed to your own harm as a result. Your damage awards can be reduced all the way down to zero dollars. That is the end of negligence. All right, sorry, it is actually, I'm thinking about it now, it's probably a little bit briefer than what um, this thing has been in previous years. I personally don't think it's worth talking about negligence in too much depth because it just fills your brain. Oh, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? With a whole bunch of little rules, and I think it's way more important for you guys to have a good handle of the structure of it rather than the minutia bits and pieces to it. So that's, that's really what I'm aiming for there. But anyway, the last two slides is talking about damages and going back to my, me raving about contract law, how damages and contract law put you where you would have been in, and tort is the opposite. It puts you back to where you were. All right, that's this, this real key distinction between the two. You can't, um, yeah, the idea, as much as money can. Uh, but yeah, also note that difference between um, uh, intentional and non-intentional torts. Plaintiff, in, for the intentional torts, or the specific torts, plaintiff can claim damage, which is a natural and probable consequence. Um, whereas the non-intentional torts, meaning negligence here, only things that are reasonably foreseeable. It's got a, a narrower scope of operation. And so in many ways, and some of the commentary suggests that uh, that, that first one actually is more similar to what we have in, in contract law. And it's things that flow as a natural consequence of a particular form of tortious action. And the reason for that um, the example here, I'm thinking the tort of deceit, is that the person suffering the loss, you know, the, 
the person who lies is part of, you know, and again, I'm thinking in terms of misrepresentation and contract law, the person who, who lies in terms of doing this really ought not to be able to use the, this defense of narrowing scope saying, oh, it wasn't reasonably foreseeable when I lied to you about the quality of these goods that you were going to go and take those goods, uh, you know, the quality of these um, life jackets that you were going to go and sell them to somebody else and then they were going to give them to their kids and then the kids got hurt. You know, that wasn't reasonably foreseeable. It's like, no, you lied. And as a result, for the intentional torts, they say that, no, it doesn't matter. Anything that was a natural consequence of the particular tort, you can be held liable for. But for negligence, it's not. Things have to be reasonably foreseeable. There has to be some way of the person at the time they fell below that standard and they did the breach and the, and the harm was caused. There has to be some way of the person who had a duty of care to actually be able to foresee some consequences of these things. And the reason for that, we don't want, as a society, to place duties on people willy-nilly, everywhere. We don't have any problem imposing liability on people who lie or those that actively go and whack other people. We've got no problem with that. If you whack somebody, it didn't matter that they had a soft skull. You whack them. Therefore, you can be compensate them for everything that flows as a natural consequence. For negligence, we're not going to do that. Because when you're sitting and putting duties on people, duty of care, there's only a certain amount of things you do. We're not supermen. We can only act like a reasonably competent solicitor, doctor, accountant as part of doing this. So that's why that's there. Okay, and just note um, this last slide here. You've got actual damage. Um, again, you've got, obviously you've got economic loss and you've got damage to property. So you've got economic loss, damage to your goods, um, your goods, or your company, or your land, or your buildings. But you also can get personal injury, which can be physical injury. And your physical injury can lead to your loss of income streams. That is compensatable as well. Loss of income streams, provided it's reasonably foreseeable. And, uh, for negligence anyway, not for battery. Um, uh, what was the last one? And psychiatric injury. With psychiatric injury, you've got to go and actually seek psychiatric help. Because the whole point is, you're being compensated to put you back to where you were. What's the easiest way of determining how much it's going to cost? Well, go to a psychologist. What were your actual medical bills? Or what are they likely to continue being? That's the amount that you're going to get. Um, that's how they that's how they calculate those things. And so your assessment task involves you guys to have a little bit of uh, a thought uh, about that. All right. Um, I think I'd mentioned earlier for the those early torts, the battery and, and defamation and all of those things. Strictly speaking, you can be awarded ten dollars. All right. In negligence, you can't. You've got to actually prove some form of harm. All right, there's three different types of damages here. Ordinary damages, again, designed to put you where you were and designed to, um, to compensate you for the actual you know, loss, you the injury, your loss of income, things that you can calculate easily. All right, but there's two other types. And remember the example I gave before about false imprisonment, how the guy got like $100,000 because the police came, the police, I think it might have been security guys actually came, held him down and then urinated on him. That's pretty nasty, that's pretty awful. Um, so in that one there, it was aggravated damages were awarded where there's serious injury to the plaintiff's feelings caused by outrageous conduct, insult, or humiliation. All right? And just, again, aggravated damage, Fraser Anning with the egg as a public figure ain't going to get aggravated damages. It's an egg, mate. Oh, no. You're, you know, you know harden up. You're a public figure. That's why. But if you or I had that, we probably would get aggravated damages if we were on national TV and somebody came up and humiliated us. Uh, in some way, even if it was just you know, slapping us in the head or something similar. All right, exemplary damages is another type. So you've got ordinary, aggregated, where the circumstances are really bad, and you have exemplary damages, which are actually not to compensate. They, exemplary damages, are awarded pretty rarely by courts in order to prevent others from doing this thing. It's actually an unusual, if you think about the purpose of tort, it's actually an unusual thing, because we're not trying to usually punish. We're not trying to deter, we're trying to compensate people, to put them back. Whereas you can actually get, in some circumstances, randomly you might say, an amount of money to, um, 
to stop others, to demonstrate to the world that this conduct is not appropriate. Um, one thing you do find, judges don't map these things out very well. They mix and match aggravated and exemplary. And I think that's because just in terms of public policy, judges are not supposed to make law. Remember, who exactly is the, the best entity to go about demonstrating to the world what sort of things ought to be penalised or punishment? It's Parliament ought to be doing that. So that's that I found, again, in my own legal research, that these two things get blended a little bit. But strictly speaking, from our perspective, that's what uh, each of those terms mean. Um, in terms of one cause of action, wouldn't a lump sum. All right, Australia and New Zealand are completely different in terms of this. I don't know what other jurisdictions. I don't know what Kenya, India, PNG. I don't know how they work for these things over here in terms of this attitude. But the idea is it's a once and for all amount you get here in Australia. And I think all the Australian jurisdictions, but certainly in Queensland. The idea is that you get a fixed sum of money, it's a large sum of money, and that's the end of it. All right. In other countries, like in New Zealand, there's no personal injury law. So this is just literally, you, you actually can't get ordinary damages for personal injury in New Zealand. You can get aggravated, you can get exemplary, but you can't get ordinary damages. Why? Because they have a no faults compensation scheme when people get injured. That's why adventure sports, if you go to New Zealand and you get injured, you just go to the hospital and they'll fix you up. They'll just fix you up like that and you'll get physios and you'll get all those things. The idea is we've got a, a scheme, everyone pays a certain amount with your wages to just put into a pool of money to compensate people. So we don't need personal injury lawyers, but you do have them here. It's a big industry in, in, in Queensland. Um, but just make note, it used to be that you would get massive lump sums. The Civil Liabilities Act was essentially written by the insurance industry. And they have reduced, they've pressured Parliament to reduce those numbers. So that getting injured, losing an arm, the most you can get from losing an arm is going to be this amount of money, you know, $300,000. Um, that's why, in terms of personal injury, those things are actually mapped out in a little book. And so for you guys, I think there's personal injury in your thing there. Yeah, it's probably worth doing a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of research for your task and see if you can find those scales to try and determine where they sit in terms of that. Because usually they'll say injury to an arm, very, very worst, very, very least worst. And they try to have a dollar value in between where they pick. Um, Finally, oh, okay, just as a matter of um, uh, convenience, if when you're trying to work out future income streams or you know, in terms of loss, things that, are, that you need to be compensated for now for th events that may or may not happen in the future, they basically say, look, if something is almost certainly going to happen, um, I'm almost certainly going to start working on level three on Monday. Oh, Tuesday. Tuesday. Um, if I look really, really sad in two weeks' time, it's because I'm doing, uh, changing roles to be an online developer. It doesn't affect this, uh, this class, but I'll be sad, probably. I'm very angry. Does anybody here absolutely hate LearnJCU? Just this is general, I'm genuinely asking this class. Do you, have you guys had difficulties with using it, using it over the years? No, you don't, not really? No one's had any real problems? Okay. I have problems with it. Anyway, the key thing to note, I'm going to be doing that from Tuesday. And it's 19, roughly 99% likely I'm going to be turning up on Tuesday morning. And so if something happens between now and then, the courts will just accept that as being um, a forego conclusion. Whereas if it's something that's very, very, very unlikely, they'll just reduce that to zero. So no, nah, if it's very unlikely, no, nah, not going to happen. It's too remote. Fails the test of remoteness. All right, and that is the last slide. What are we, 835 here? Yeah. We might leave it at that. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. I'll yield any questions about this stuff. So it always feels like it's a little rushed through with this, this bit. The key takeaway from this lecture is the elements of the tort of negligence. And unfortunately, you're going to need to know how to apply them to a scenario. So this the scenario that you've got in this will require a little bit of research because, again, there's a bit of personal injury. They're trying to come up with um, scenarios to do with um, coffee grinders explode. I clearly have no idea what a coffee roaster looks like. I'm writing this problem, I'm like, I don't know how this works. But it's, um, it just, it'll require you guys to be a little bit thoughtful, go through and have a little look at those scales, but you are going to need to map out and explain the elements of the tort of negligence. I can guarantee it'll be an exam question. Um, so just, just be, be mindful of that. All right, team, thanks for, thanks for 
thanks for coming i'm really impressed by the way with this class and this, perhaps this is unfair and relative to the um to the other uh, to the undergraduate offering but the um the attendance is really good you guys are here it's amazing lovely to see you all <laughs>